Hello brothers and sisters in Christ and welcome back to part three of Salvation for Lost Sinners. Belief. But what is that belief in? Is that belief in the Jesus Christ or a Jesus Christ? Is that belief in the Jesus or a Jesus? First I want to talk about I'm a King James Bible believer. A lot of you brothers and sisters in Christ out there, you're King James Bible believers too. This is God's perfect written word. And why is this so important that this is God's perfect written word? That we have a perfect standard. Okay. 1 John 5.13. I want to turn there. We've got lots of verses. So if you want to pause the video, I'm going to try to take a breathe. I'm going to breathe in between each verse that we go to. Pause the video and turn in your King James Bible. But I'm trying to keep the video as small as I can. Because they tend to get large when I do a lot of verses. So 1 John 5.13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. If it wasn't for this book, Perfect Written Word of God, you're not capable of believing in the Jesus Christ. Okay? Remember, the Jesus Christ. Psalms 138.2 I will worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Okay? Again and again, Jesus is always saying, it is written, it is written. Um, the Bible talks about the word of God being sharper than any two-edged sword, tearing asunder, and it sees the thoughts and intents of the heart. Okay? Jesus in Revelation, he opens his mouth and a sword comes out, his word wipes out the 200 million man army. Okay? His word is elevated above his name. That's how important his word is. God's word is to him. Matthew 24, 35, Mark 30, 13, 31, you don't have to turn here, and Luke 21, 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. I believe the real reason for these Bible perversions, the more I've done this study, is the Bible perversions promote a Jesus Christ. And you'll find out why I'm putting them down here in a bit. In a, bit. a Jesus Christ, which is actually the Antichrist, Satan, and you have the Jesus Christ. I think I said a. Okay, a Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and say it. I put Jesus, the Jesus Christ up here because we conform to the Jesus Christ. He is above us. We conform to Him. He's our King. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's our Master. I had someone say that I'm not His slave. Uh, I'm His bondservant. He's my Master. He's my teacher. He's my friend. He's my God. Okay? He's up here. These Bible perversions put Jesus down here and makes Him a Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus gets to conform to you. And that's what the whole appeal to all these false Christs out there, a Jesus Christ, is because you get that Jesus to conform to you. And if you don't like that Jesus, what do you do? Get a different Bible version. If you don't like a Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ that you're on, well, you can find another Babel building. Okay. Why do we have all these Bible perversions? It's to get people away from the Jesus Christ for a Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ, you don't want to conform to the Jesus Christ of the King James Bible? Well, Satan's like, I'll give you a Jesus Christ. I'll give you the world. If you saw the study about repentance, I'll give you the world. The world's way is sin. Just worship me. I'll give you a Jesus Christ that gives you what you want as long as you worship me. I'm talking about Satan, not myself. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's get in the brunt of this. Let's get started. The whole point of this study, brothers and sisters of Christ, remember, we will talk about the, uh, what happened to Jesus on the cross, but the main point of this is for instruction in righteousness, for Bible-believing Christians that are already saved, and to really plead with absolute truth to false converts that are believing in a Jesus Christ, not the Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mark 1.3 why does repentance come before belief? Why is it if you refuse to repent and take it out, you're not capable of believing in the Jesus Christ. You're only capable of believing in a Jesus Christ. Okay. Mark 1.3 The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. I have that highlighted. Make his path straight. 
John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay? Right now you're saying, well, he's preparing the way of the Lord. We're going to find out later, as we keep going, that what he's preaching is you repent first, you get baptized, and then you're capable of believing in the way of the Lord. Okay? The next verse, uh, or Matthew Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Turn here for a second. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John was preaching that Jesus Christ, making way, uh, preparing the way of the Lord, Jesus Christ, their king, was coming to reign, rule and reign. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay. How do we know this? Matthew 11, 12 says, you don't have to turn here, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Okay? He was preaching repentance, bat then you've been baptized, and then you're confessing your sins, but he's preaching that the confessing sins is we need to turn back to God. Our king is coming. Jesus is coming. Okay? We'll find that out in a little bit. Matthew 11, 12. So here's the brunt of it. Okay, why does repentance come before belief? Why is it, if you skip true biblical repentance, sorrow for sinning against God? It's not admitting that I'm a sinner, and that's that. It's coming to Him as a sinner, admitting, confessing that you are a sinner, and all, or in the heart, it's believing that you're a sinner, and having sorrow for sinning against God. That's the true biblical definition of repentance as it applies to salvation. Okay, it's something that happens in the heart. It's not going from unbelief to belief. It's not just flat out confessing that you're a sinner. I've had lost people confess they're sinners. They don't want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Is that true biblical repentance? No, it is not. And repentance, they're trying to say it's a work now to keep people away from true biblical repentance. Okay. Matthew eleven twelve. And from the day of John the Baptist until now, oh, we already did that one, sorry. Skip ahead a little bit. Matthew chapter 3, verse 3. For this, he, for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the, crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. There we see it again. Make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel hair, and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, what's going on here? People are coming out, they're repenting, they're being baptized, and John the Baptist is preaching that someone's coming. The way of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Our king is coming. Okay. Now, let's read the next part. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Meat. What does the word meat mean? Sometimes we, we see words and we just, maybe we know what they mean, or we just not take too much time like we should to look at definitions. Meat, fit, suitable, qualified, purposed, purpose. Okay? Bring forth, therefore, meats that qualify that you had repentance. It's evidence that you repented. But how do we know from this passage that repentance came before baptism? These Pharisees, same as the Pharisees today, all these Pharisees today, um, they were coming down because, hey, people are being baptized. It's a physical, visual thing. Everybody's into it. It's what's popular. And they thought, well, we'll come down so we can be part of the crowd. We're the religious leaders. This is supposed to be something religious. Well, we need to be part of this. Maybe even take over it. But they came down there and they refused to repent. Did John baptize them and then call them out for not repenting? He refused to baptize them because they didn't repent. They need to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. John, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, inside him could see their heart and say they were not right with the Lord. 
they refuse to repent. Okay. Okay. So back again, he was pre preaching repentance. Okay, and then belief in the kingdom of heaven, repentance of sin, and belief that their king was coming, and he was baptizing people and for the remission of sins. Okay, now we're going to turn to Matthew 21, 23. This is Jesus Christ. This is also very important. Okay. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? This is God manifest in the flesh. Okay. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not believe, not then believe him? There's the belief part. But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. Now here's a very important part, a little side step, a side part. And they answered Jesus and said, we can not tell. Not that we don't know, we don't know. I guess we just, we don't know. I can not tell. You know, it's kind of like that thing in the courtroom where you say, I plead the fifth, you know. I, I refuse to answer as the answer might serve to incriminate me. They cannot tell because either answer made them, called them out, and showed them for who they really were. Right. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will. I will not, I'm sorry, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. Okay, repentance is always of the heart. He said, it's in his heart, you know what, I shouldn't have said no. I should go. That happens in the heart. Evidence that he repented, he went. And he came to the second and said likewise, and he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his, of his father, they saith unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. We're going to find out why. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness. In other words, God gave him the authority. Because remember, there's none righteous, no, not one. Only God is righteous, Jesus Christ. And ye believed him not. Here's the key, they believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe him. Why couldn't the Pharisees believe John the Baptist? Why didn't they believe Jesus Christ? They refused to repent. Okay, Acts 19.4. If you want to turn to Acts 19.4. Like I said, you want to believe in the Jesus Christ or a Jesus Christ? Can't skip repentance. Acts 19.4 Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Repentance and belief. Repentance comes first, then belief. Mark 1.14 now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Okay, the, millennial, the thousand year reign. Uh, we call it the millennial kingdom, but it's the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ as their king. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Just believe in me. And then repent. No, it says, repent ye and believe the gospel gospel at that time was that you had to repent of your sins, godly sorrow for sinning against God, and those sins was that they turned from God, they turned from the law, and they were to turn to Jesus Christ and believe 
that Jesus Christ is their king. Okay? Now, people always say, people are going to hit me up and say, well, this is Old Testament. It is Old Testament. Remember, the death of Jesus Christ is what brings in the New Testament. Okay? This is Old Testament, but it's the great example throughout the Bible that repentance comes before belief. You skip repentance, what did Jesus say unto them? Okay, because, see, you repented not afterward that ye might believe him. They refused to repent, they weren't capable of believing in John the Baptist because they refused to repent. They're not capable of believing in Jesus Christ. But, let's get into the New Testament. Okay, what happened to Jesus Christ? We're going to go over it real quick. The belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Isaiah 53, 5. We're going to go through these real quick. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. He was whipped. He was whipped hardcore. Blood pouring out. Not pouring, but you know what I'm saying? Blood was leaking out all over. He was whipped all over. Isaiah 56. Here's the thing about the beard. I always say the beard's ripped out, and people say, where is that at in the Bible? I gave my back to the smiters, and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. What do you have on your cheeks? A beard. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. They were spitting on him, and they were doing everything they could to shame Jesus Christ. John 19.2, And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. They were shaming him. Isaiah 52.14, As many were st st astonished or stoned at the his visage, his visage, visage, I'm trying to say it right, was so marred more than any man and his form more than the son of men. That's why I kept saying he was beaten so bad they couldn't recognize Jesus Christ. If someone come by and just met Jesus Christ once or twice, they'd come by and look at the cross and go, I met Jesus once, because there's a, they had to put a sign up there, Jesus, King of the Jews, in three different languages. That's Jesus? Are you sure that's Jesus? I, I don't recognize him. Are you sure that's Jesus? He was beaten that bad. Okay. Mark 10.13 And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. Okay. Matthew 27.35 And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did he vesture did they cast lots. When we get saved and people step up in the ministry, the Bible says that we're to feed the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. Jesus went through a lot of punishment for sin and he was sinless. He became sin who knew no sin. Okay, He was nailed to a cross. He was crucified. He took on the sins of the world, took on the debt, the punishment, I couldn't even fathom it. I'll... You look up there and you look at him, and by, brothers and sisters in Christ, we're to look at him, put him up here, and we're to look at him and say, I deserve that, not him. I deserve to go through that, not Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. You look at that and you see so many people take out repentance, and you look at him and say, Look what he went through. How can you take repentance out? Look what he went through because of your sins. Where's the godly sorrow? Lord, I am a sinner. I deserve what he's going through. He doesn't deserve that. I do. I deserve to go to hell. Jesus didn't go to hell real quick. I deserve to go to hell. I deserve the punishment for sin. He doesn't. He's the perfect lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice for sins, to pay for our, to pay for the sins of the world. You want your sins paid for, you have to go to the cross. If you don't, at the judgment, at the great white throne judgment, where the lost world's going to be judging people who die in their sins, 
and reject Jesus Christ, you'll be paying for your sins then, and you'll be paying for it for all eternity. Jesus can wash your sins away. Jesus can pardon you of your sins. Okay? You're not capable of believing in the real Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ that we put so far up here, you can't even see my hand anymore, hopefully, so far up here, what he went through. Because of our true biblical repentance, godly sorrow for sinning against God, admitting that you're a sinner but having godly sorrow for it, we're able to believe in our heart the real Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ, not a Jesus Christ down here. All right. Now, real quick, I decided I'm going to do a separate study apart from this series explaining what Jesus went through before leading up to the cross, why things happened the way they did. Now, I'm not a scholar, and I don't have PhD, THDs, but it's not that complicated, okay? Here's why. Matthew 5, 17. Think not that I, came, that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not, I came, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Notice what he says there. I came to... I am I have come to just I can say it right. Think not that I am come to destroy the law. This guy's getting crazy. I came not to destroy the law or the prophets. Why did everything happen the way it did leading up to Jesus Christ's death on the cross? I'm talking about what actually happened. Okay, prophecy. Was all prophecies fulfilled? No. The Jewish people rejected Jesus Christ and the kingdom was put off. So all the prophecy has been fulfilled. But I'm talking about everything that was fulfilled that happened to Jesus from his birth all the way to his death on the cross and resurrection. Okay? Why did that happen? The law and prophecy. Like I said, I want to do a different, different separate study. Okay? Now let's get into what the gospel is, okay? 1 Corinthians 15, 1. We saw what Jesus went through. Beard ripped out. Beaten beyond recognition. Whipped. Stripes where there was cuts all over him. Bleeding. He was nailed to a cross. And was crucified. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if, Bible if, you are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If what they preach will go down, there's a verse there that says that somebody preached another gospel than we did. We preach this, that, other than what we're preaching. Paul preached repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And you have all these people that take repentance out, so their belief is not in the Jesus Christ, it's in a Jesus Christ, and their belief is in vain. Okay? You can believe in a Jesus Christ, and you're going to wind up in hell to burn for all eternity. Because you don't believe in the Jesus Christ. That's how serious this is. Okay? Turn to Titus 1.16. An example. They profess that they know God. Everybody that you talk to knows, they have the head knowledge, they know the gospel. They don't know the plan of salvation, but they know the gospel. They can tell you that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose again the third day. They profess that they know God, but the Jesus they worship is a Jesus, but not the Jesus. Why? Because in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. I know a Jesus, but they don't know the Jesus. Why do people believe in vain? Like I just said, they believe in a Jesus. I was a false convert for most of my life. I believed in a Jesus, and the Jesus I believed in conformed to me. He was okay with my sin. He was okay with the way I was living my life. He was okay with 
everything that the Bible's against. He was the Jesus I like because he's a Jesus and I, had, I made sure he conformed to me. Okay? I uh, had Bible perversions. I was taught a Jesus but not the Jesus Christ. True biblical re repentance comes before belief. Why? Because you're not capable of believing in Jesus Christ if you skip the Jesus Christ, if you skip repentance. So we're going to go through John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. What's the definition of, of condemn? Sentence to punishment. Hell. Condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Through him might be saved. Through the Jesus Christ, you can get saved. Through a Jesus Christ, which is an antichrist, you're not going to get saved. Okay. Romans 6.23. Stay in John 3.16, or if you want to, hold, hold there. Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Condemned. Sentenced to death. Hell. And then to the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Why is it so important that you're believing in the Jesus Christ? Because if you're believing in a Jesus Christ, you're going to wind up in hell. The study is for false converts and truly saved Christians. Okay, the study is not really directed at the lost world, but if someone who's lost comes across this and says, and gets saved, praise the Lord. Okay. Uh, John 3.20. Okay, we're at John 3.20. For everyone that doeth evil... How do you know this? Has to, if you read this, you can see repentance in here. Everyone that doeth evil, evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. What is that? They refuse to repent. They love the world. The world's way is sin. And they love their sin. They refuse to repent. But he that doeth truth, repentance towards God, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, cometh to the light, Jesus saves them that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Changed life. Evidence of salvation. Okay. Um, we're going to be coming back to John, John chapter 3, but John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. It's so important that you're believing in the Jesus Christ, not a Jesus Christ. You're to conform to him. And you're... He, you need to lift him and put him up here, not down here. Right. So many people, oh, I, I used to be a Christian, but now I, I'm an atheist. Or I used to be, you know, a King James Bible believer, but now I'm a Jehovah's Witness, or a Mormon, or Catholic, or Methodist, or Presbyterian, Angelican, non-denominational. Why is that? Why do they fall away from the Jesus Christ? Because they were never believing in the Jesus Christ. They believed in a Jesus Christ. They were never saved. Okay, 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Okay? The changed life is evidence of repentance and true belief in the Jesus Christ, and I'm always going to do this because Jesus Christ needs to be put up here, the Jesus Christ, is evidence that when you believe in the Jesus Christ, it's evidence of repentance. The changed life is evidence of repentance. Okay. okay. The depart from iniquity. Okay. I've always said this. When you get saved, God saves you. You can't save yourself. It's not faith alone. And it's not, you guys die in a state of grace. You work your way to heaven. I've come across so many people that claim to be Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. They just live in wicked, wicked sin. And they, and they say, I don't believe I can earn salvation. But you look at their works. Uh, I might be this wicked sinner, but, you know, as far as how they live, I'm still a sinner. Okay, I don't deserve to go to heaven. Even as a saved man, it's only by God's grace. Okay. But they live very wickedly and they, make up, they try to make up for it by saying, well, I went out and, and did gospel tracting. Or I went out and 
I preach the gospel, or well, I make sure to have my Bible and I try to, I try to read it once a day. And then they go on and live and look like the world, act like the world, and they choose the world. What is that? That's works-based salvation. They think they can do enough good deeds that will outweigh the bad deeds without admitting it. Their actions say it. Okay. But I've always said you struggle with sin, you don't justify sin. People who have chosen the world justify sin. And you'll see it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It will come out. They skip repentance, they justify sin, and you realize they're not believing in the, in the Jesus Christ of Scripture. They're believing in a Jesus Christ, but not the Jesus Christ of Scripture. I used to say they, their belief is up here, but not down here. Uh, no, they know of a Jesus Christ. They're not believing in the Jesus Christ. The only way to believe in the Jesus Christ is here. And it won't happen here if you skip repentance. That's why I believe we have a lot of false converts. They skip repentance, and then they're not able to believe in the Jesus Christ. Now, go back to... No, we're still at 2 Timothy 2.19, verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Okay, saved versus lost. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Okay, instruction of righteousness for people who believe. It's telling you, hey, make sure that you're not, that you're falling under the wood of, I mean, the gold and the silver, and not wood and of earth. Because notice it says, but also of wood and earth. Not only vessels of gold and silver, I see, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but wood, hay, and earth. It's talking about people that warning you that you need to make sure your, your good works are based off Scripture, the changed life. Okay? And some to dishonor. If any man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. I've known people that fall back into sin. Okay, and God will not use somebody that falls back into sin. You need to struggle with sin. You need to deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow Jesus Christ. Repent, forsake, and get back to where you left off with Jesus Christ. But you can tell somebody who's fake because they justify sin. And God won't use you, okay, except for a bad example and, and as evidence that you're false. Okay, Ephesians 2.10 for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Notice up there what we read up there. Good works, prepared unto every good work. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. When you get saved, you are in Christ Jesus, and good works follow. It's evidence of salvation, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Repentance Godly sorrow leads to real belief in the real Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ, okay? And it leads to a changed life. No! Victoria's scratching at the door. Sorry about that loud no. Okay, ordained. What does ordained mean? Appointed. Established. Okay. We are appointed and we are established into good works after salvation. They will come after salvation. If anybody tells you there's not a changed life, they're a servant of Satan. Well, there can be, but there doesn't have to be. They're a servant of Satan. There's a verse in there that says that all, um, that there should, uh, Ephesians, I didn't put this down, Ephesians 5, let me look this up real quick. Is it Ephesians 5? Okay, here it is. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which, could, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And they take the word should. But doesn't it say somewhere else that God is not willing that 
any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? When people attack that and say, well, it says should, they, they might as well attack that too. You don't have to repent. And they do. True biblical salvation, the plan of salvation, has always been repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I, like I said, I just wanted to say that. People take should and say, well, you don't really have to. Uh, yes, you do. The changed life is going to happen. We just read that, okay? John 14, 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Repentance and belief happen in the heart. Okay? And when you truly get come to God broken and believing in the real Jesus Christ, you're going to confess both to prayer and you're going to call out to the, call on the Lord and God's going to look at your heart and see if you have a pure heart. Did you truly repent? Are you believing in the real Jesus Christ and not a Jesus Christ? God looks at the heart. Okay? 2 Timothy 2.23 but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. I'm doing this out of love. I'm doing this with meekness to those who believe in a Jesus Christ. I'm not doing it out of hate and spite. I'm doing it out of meekness and love. You need to get that figured out. Did you truly repent godly sorrow? Or did you part of that part of a system that skips repentance? It's not part of salvation. Or were you told a part of a group that says, repentance is just admitting you're a sinner? Are you part of a group that says, well, repentance is just going from unbelief to belief. The sin of unbelief is what you're repenting of. Godly sorrow for sinning against God is true biblical repentance. Okay? Are you part of a group that says repentance is a work and they take it out completely? Okay. Are you believing in the real Jesus Christ? Well, no. Well, then you look at their life and what they stand for, and they're opposing themselves, and we are trying to instruct you using God's perfect written word, saying, Thus saith the Lord. Conform, I conform to the Lord, and turn around and say, Thus saith the Lord. People who get Jesus down here to conform to them, it's thus saith my preferences, what I want. If God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, there it is again. You have to repent before you can acknowledge the truth. And they that may recover themselves, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. What is acknowledging? Confessing, approving, grateful. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. I don't know why it's so hard for people, but notice it says there, um, okay, notice it also says they recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. What I say about the Jesus down here, a Jesus, he's actually Satan. He's an antichrist. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But real quick, 2 Peter 2.20. Right there we said repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. We're going to find out that acknowledging and knowing, knowledge, is two different things. 2 Timothy 2.20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Okay. You can have the head knowledge of Jesus Christ. Knowledge, a clear and certain perception of that which exists, truth and fact. You can have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I know about Bigfoot. Do I believe in Bigfoot? No. It has to do with evolution. I know what the Mormons believe. Does that mean I, I believe as they do? I have the knowledge. I don't believe them. They're lost and on the way to hell. They don't believe Jesus is God. Jehovah's Witness, same way. Jesus is, they don't believe Jesus is God. Okay? All these false religions, I know of them. 
I know what an atheist believes. Does that mean I believe as they do? No. All right. You can have the head knowledge. You can know of a Jesus Christ, but you don't, you're not acknowledging the Jesus Christ, not head, the Jesus Christ, forgive me, the Jesus Christ, you're not acknowledging the Jesus Christ. Titus 1.16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. It goes back to what I said, I've talked to people that say, I know Jesus, they know a Jesus, and they try to do good works to make up for their bad works, their sin. They want to keep their sin, so they do all these good works like, why aren't you going to church? You're supposed to go to church. They can live in wicked sin as long as they're outside the church, that building. Okay? They do all these stuff to try to justify their sin. They're basically trying to work their way to heaven without saying, I'm working my way to heaven. Mm -hmm. Their works, they deny Him. They know a Jesus Christ, but they deny the Jesus Christ. They're trying to work their way to heaven. Um, Acts 8.37, okay, this is one a lot of people fight. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Okay, it happens in the heart. And we'll, further down, we'll come back to this to talk about why I believe there was repentance involved in that story. Because people say it isn't, but it's there. Okay. We're reading, the, remember, obey the gospel. Obey the truth. Okay? The, God, the plan of salvation, repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's preached over and over and over in the book of Acts. It's preached in the Old Testament when it was repent and believe that the gospel was the kingdom of heaven. Okay, all through the Pauline epistles, uh, Romans, repent, believe. Okay, we read First Corinthians fifteen, verse one through four. You can believe in vain because you refuse to repent. Romans ten nine. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart. Man believeth unto righteousness. God's, Jesus Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. Okay? Our righteousness is no good. And you have the lost world, their self-righteousness, they want, I, I said in my last study, I believe worldly sorrow is the number one reason people go to hell. Worldly sorrow leads to self-righteousness. It has to. How else are you going to justify your sin? To justify keeping your sin. The world's way is sin and you're choosing the world. Well, you have to be self-righteous. Well, I'm not that bad of a person. I'm still a good person. That's how you justify it. Worldly sorrow will always lead to self-righteousness. But we believe with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We're not at that, um, that part of the series when we get to confessing both in prayer and call upon the name of the Lord. But it says, shows there it comes before salvation, before God saves you. But right there, the important part is the heart. God looks at the heart. Okay. We read up there with uh, Philip when he was talking to the eunuch. He says, in thy heart you need to believe. Not in the head, in the heart. Now we're going to go back to John. John chapter 3, we're at 21. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. We talked about this, the changed life. Fruits meet for repentance. How do you know someone truly repented and they believe in the real Jesus Christ? The changed life. Okay? That, the, that his deeds may be manifest that they are wrought in God. They line up with Scripture. Romans 8, 1. Okay? Hold your finger there. Or Actually, we're going to go through some other verses. Okay, because we're done with John. Rotten God, make sure your works are based off scripture and changed life is evidence. My changed life, you look at me before I got saved, nobody would look at me today and go, I'm the same person. My house is a godly home. I've gotten so much stuff out of my life. I dress differently. I look differently. I eat differently. I try to eat healthy. I talk differently. God has changed my life and he's cleaned up my life. Okay? And I might be jumping the gun, but I believe someone who's truly saved 
born again, God's going to clean up your life hardcore at the beginning. We're going to talk about this, how you're a carnal as a babe in Christ. But if you're still carnal as a mature person, that's a problem. A mature Christian, that's a problem. Okay? But I believe God will change up. He cleaned up like 50% of my life within the first year. I fought him for two years. But there's going to be a drastic change at the beginning of salvation, after salvation. God's going to start cleaning up your life and your heart and your desire is going to be, I saw what Jesus went through because of my sins. I don't want to sin against God anymore. I want to change life. I want to please God. You know what doesn't please God? Sin. Disobedience is sin. Right? I don't want to dis I, don't, I want to please God. I want to honor God. We talked about to, some to honor, some to dishonor. I want to honor God. Romans 8 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. We talked about this. Punishment, which is hell, to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. We're going to struggle with the flesh, but you're not to walk after the flesh. Okay, you're supposed to walk after the Spirit. And notice there again, it says, in Christ Jesus. Make sure that you're believing in the Jesus Christ. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak, through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He took on sin. He became sin who knew no sin. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, when He was nailed on the cross, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Right. When you get saved, your flesh is no longer in charge. It's that simple. You're going to say, God, you are in charge. Jesus Christ, you are in charge. I'm conforming to you. What do you want me to do? You command me. You tell me what to do. Okay? Your flesh is no longer in charge. You're going to struggle with the flesh. Okay? That's going to be there. But your flesh is not in charge. You do not walk after the flesh, you walk after the spirit. Okay. I did a video recently of people justifying video games, movies, TV shows. You got people trying to justify drinking and they're and they go too far all, a lot and they, they're alcoholics. They try to justify drinking, they try to justify smoking, they try to justify this, they try to justify that. They want to walk in the flesh. When you truly get saved, you're not going to want to walk in the flesh. You're going to want to walk in the Spirit. You're going to pray a lot. You're going to trust the Lord. You're going to obey Him. Like I said, you're going to put Jesus up here, and you're going to treat Him as your King, your Lord, your Savior, your Master, your Teacher, your Friend. One of these days I'll end up getting around to doing a study of all the relationships that we can have with Jesus, and you can't have that kind of relationship with anybody on this earth. Nobody. The kind of relationships, plural, that we have with Jesus Christ up here. We don't put Jesus Christ down here. A lot of people saying, well, they don't treat him like a king. He's not, I'm not a slave. He's not my master. Okay. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Okay. Continuing on. For to be carnally minded is death. That is key, okay? What does death refer to a lot in the King James Bible in the New Testament? Maybe sometimes in the Old Testament. I haven't really studied it that far as far as the Old Testament. New Testament, death is often a refer reference to hell. For the wages of sin is death, okay? Condemnation is punishment, which is hell, okay? To be carnally minded is death. I'm going to stop there for a second. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. When you first get saved, your life is carnal. 
That's because we don't believe, true Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, we don't believe repentance is a work. Why? Because after you get saved, you're going to be carnal. You don't clean up your life before you come to Christ. You come to Him broken. Repentance. Broken. Then you can look at the cross and look at everything He went through, and that belief is in the heart, and you're believing in the Jesus Christ, not a Jesus Christ. We believe that, but my point that I'm making here is, is it says carnal, but unto carnal, even unto, unto babes in Christ. When you first get saved, you're going to be carnal. There's going to be a lot that God's going to be working on you. He had so much to work on me when I first got saved. It's, it's a miracle and by God's grace that He's gotten me. And it's only because of God that I've gotten to where I am today. God got me here. There's no way I could have gotten here. Okay? But the point of that is, is when you get start moving on to meat and you start becoming mature where you can start having meat, like a baby has milk, when they get old enough they can start eating meat when the child gets old enough. When you get to the meat, there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. At that point, you go back up to where it says carnally minded. Okay. Uh, what is it? Verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death. When we're in Romans 8, 6. When you get to that point and you look at a Christian, oh, I've been saved for 10 years. I've been saved for 20 years. I've been saved for 30 years. And they're still carnal? Uh, they're no longer just carnal like you are when you first get saved. They're carnally minded. Why? Because they refuse to repent. They don't believe in the Jesus Christ. They believe in a Jesus Christ that's okay with them having the world. Make sure you're believing in the Jesus Christ of Scripture, the King James Bible, not a Jesus Christ of the world, and ignoring Scripture. A lot of Bible-believing Christians out there ignore Scripture because they want to believe in a Jesus Christ. They claim to be Bible-believing Christians. They want, to be, they want to believe in a Jesus Christ so they can have the world. They can have their sin. Mm -hmm. So when you become a Christian, like I said, God's going to clean your life up quick. He's going to clean it up quick. I'm talking about I'm still being sanctified to the day I die, but a lot of the big things in my life that were right in your face, the movies that had a lot of you know fornication, sodomy, feminism, uh, witchcraft, cussing, whatever, video games, all that stuff, God started getting that out of my life quick. And my idea of quick is two years. Why? Because it's not going to happen overnight. But like I said, I say it's quick because I've seen people and talked to people that I've been saved for 50 years, and their life is the same way it was when the day they got saved. Okay. Romans 8, 6, we're going to continue on. We said, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay? Those people out there that claim that they're saved and they're living like the world, looking like the world, they don't have true life and they don't have peace. Okay? Why? Because they have to keep running 90 miles an hour. Because if they come to a stop, I used to do this when I was in these Babel buildings as a teenager through high school, I was running 90 miles an hour and going nowhere. But the moment you stop, everything comes flooding in. The peace isn't there. The illusion of peace because you're moving nonstop. Uh, that your life is meaningless and everything. It all comes flooding in if you come to a stop. So I kept running 90 miles an hour. And you'll see all these people going to the church buildings, these Babel buildings, doing all these things, camps, this, that, running out and hanging out with friends, sports, everybody meeting and everybody. It's just on, they have to keep running 90 miles an hour. Okay. They don't have true life and peace. Why? Because they're carnally minded. Romans 8.39 Okay, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. True love, God loving you, is you believing in Christ Jesus, the Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about, like I said, over and over, you're supposed to be in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 3.24 16.3, 1 Corinthians 1.2, Galatians 3.26, Ephesians 1.1, the Philippi, 
Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Colossians 1.28, 1 Thessalonians 2.14, and I could go on and on. You're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Why do we see the lost world professing Christians the way they are? Because they're not in the Jesus Christ. They're not in Christ Jesus. They love their A Jesus Christ, and sometimes they put the A Jesus Christ over here. I need you to go over here, A Jesus, because I'm going to start doing some sin. Okay, now I'm going to bring the A Jesus down here who conforms to me. Oh, I'm going to go do sin over here, so I'm going to put him over there. That's the Jesus the world likes. They don't like the Jesus Christ of Scripture, the Jesus that's up here. Okay, 2 Thessalonians 2.13 but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. What is that? Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of glory of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. What is sanctification? Okay. The act of making holy, in an evangelical sense, the act of God's grace by which the affections of men are purified, affections of men are purified or alienated from sin and the world. Okay. And exalted to a supreme love to God. That's one of the definitions of sanctification. Okay. Repentance. You don't want the world anymore. The world's way is sin. When did sin come into the world? Um, Adam. Uh, who's the lowercase g God of this world? Satan. You don't want your sin. You don't love your sin. Okay? Your, what is it, affections. You don't have affections for sin like this lost professing Christian world does. Okay? Repentance. That's why it says of the Spirit. It's something that happens in the heart. I'm sorry, Lord, for sinning against you. But notice there it comes before belief. Okay. People say I'm stretching. Oh well. Bottom line, sanctification of the Spirit. Something that happens in the heart, inside you. Okay. The Spirit is inside you. It's not talking about physically cleaning up your life. It's talking about your attitude. Your affections of men are purified. Put your affections on things in heaven, not on earth. Okay. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, you're going to want to please God. That's why we were created. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Okay? Lowercase g, God of this world. What has he blinded the world with? And we're going to get to some stats here shortly. What has he blinded the world with? A false Jesus Christ. An antichrist. A Jesus Christ, not the Jesus Christ. That's what I believe this is talking about. He's blinded the minds of them that believe not. You try to preach the Jesus Christ to the world, I have yet to come across one person that has never, ever, ever heard of Jesus Christ. Not one person. I have yet to come across one person. Why? Because God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. They don't believe in a real Jesus Christ. Now, why God of this world? They like to believe in a Jesus. We've said this, and I'm going to keep hammering it home. They believe in a Jesus that gives them the world. The lowercase g, God of this world. When Satan promised Jesus when he took him up to the hillside, he showed him the kingdoms of the world, said, all these are yours if you but fall down and worship me. What is he telling all these people? He's posing as Jesus Christ, a false Christ, an antichrist, saying, See the world? I'll give you the world. You can have the world. Just worship me. And they're worshiping Satan as a false Jesus Christ. 1 John 4.1 Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Okay. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. I can't remember, I think Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries in one of his Revelation expository studies for instruction in righteousness, he came across something that proved that, do you realize that today we are prophets? We were given a more sure word of prophecy. We're prophets. I can tell someone who's lost 
who rejects Jesus Christ, that if they die as future events, if they die in their sins, they will go to hell and be tossed into the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. I can do that. What does that do? That makes me a prophet. I can tell people that the time of Jacob's trouble is coming and the catching away of the body of Christ is going to happen before the time of Jacob's trouble. And the time of Jacob's trouble is for the Jewish people. And you can go through and explain a little bit about the time of Jacob's trouble. It's a different dispensation. What is that? That's future prophecy. But where do we get these prophecies? From the Word of God. Okay. So right now you're going to have a lot of false, converts, uh, false prophets come out and say, I know the way of righteousness. Let me tell you about my Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how you can really get saved. How you can have the world and be a Christian. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, you, you, can, you can have sin. You can die in your sin and still go to heaven. What is that? It's a false prophet. People coming out and saying, Oh no, it's post-trib or mid-trib. We're going to be here through that. The Bible doesn't teach that. What are they called? False prophets. There's people who believe the millennial kingdom, what we call the thousand, thousand year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. Well, that already happened. What do you call those people? False prophets. Okay, there's a lot of them out there. They're promoting a Jesus Christ and they reject a lot of them with a lot of hatred and anger. It's like they hate the real Jesus Christ, the Jesus Christ of Scripture. And you can see it in how they act and talk. I've been called names online. I, I present them with the gospel message and I've gotten a lot of hate from these people. 1 John 4 chapter 2 Hereby know we the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Okay, remember Philip and the eunuch. Now we're going to get into it a little bit more. Acts, don't have to go to it, but Acts 8.35 Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. And preached unto him Jesus. And as that's the key there. Preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? And Jesus said, If thou believest in all, with all thy, thine heart, thou mayest. And he said, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But look at the part there where it says, Preached unto him Jesus. What did Jesus tell him to go out in the world and do? Preach repentance toward repentance and belief. Oh, repentance, he never repented. He preached to him Jesus Christ. We just talked about scripture after scripture. Repentance comes before belief. Now this is early on when uh, the uh, apostles were still going to the Jewish people trying to give them a chance to believe in Jesus Christ so the kingdom could come. And they continued rejecting him, and that's when they went out to all nations. Okay, there were still Jews that believed, but the Jewish nation as a whole rejected him and crucified, let the Romans crucify him, and then, and they they let their Christ, their King, be crucified. Because I want to say it right, um, and then afterwards they still, as a nation, rejected Jesus Christ. I'm on, my studies are on Acts right now, reading through on how many times that every time one of the apostles were getting through the Jewish people and some were starting to believe, you'd have others cause problems, get up and get people to turn against them. Kind of like today where you get people who pretend to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, and then when you least expect it, they get people to turn against you. They mess people up. So, uh, 1 John 4.3 we're still there. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. People believe in a Jesus Christ, but they don't want to believe in the Jesus Christ. The Jesus they believe in is Antichrist. It's an Antichrist spirit. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now is already in the world. Okay. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you. Remember, you're in Christ Jesus, but Jesus said, I will be in you. But you have the Holy Spirit in you. They're one and the same. Okay, Jesus in you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The false Jesus, Satan. Okay, Satan is the lowercase g, God of this world. They are of the world, these false converts. If you're a false convert out of here, 
and you reject the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, and faith in the Jesus Christ, you are of the world. You think you can have the world and be a Christian. Therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. Here's the thing I wanted to point, bring out. Here we're going to get into st statistics. Why do people reject the Jesus Christ for a Jesus Christ? The Jesus Christ that loves the world as far as the way of the world. You know, the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things in the world. There's two parts to that. You're not to love anything more than Jesus Christ. Like, I have iced tea. I'm not supposed to love iced tea more than Jesus Christ. I'm not supposed to love the ocean more than Jesus Christ, because I love the view of the ocean, walk on the beach. But the first part says, love not the world. You're not to love the world. What's the world's way? Sin. The world's way is always going to be sin. Okay? So how do they get people, how does Satan get people to worship him and continue in sin and do things the world's way? Where he poses as a false Jesus Christ, the Antichrist spirit. Now I looked at some statistics. Um, this was in 2010. This is a long time ago. And right now the statistics are way higher. But the projection began with 2010 statistics when Christian, Christianity was by far the world's largest religion. Christianity. With an estimated 2.2 billion adherents, nearly a third, 31%, of all 6.9 billion people on earth. Islam who believes in a Jesus Christ, but he was just a prophet. Islam was second with 1.6 billion adherents, or 23% of the global population. So, you have these two religions. They, they, like I said, Islam was created by the Catholicism and everything. So you look at this, and you're looking at, wow, 54%. What's going on here? The world loves a Jesus Christ, and they hate the Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ isn't popular. A Jesus Christ is. Church buildings have to act like the world to win the world worshiping false Christ. That's another thing. They have to act like the world and actually give the world to these people that are coming in to try to get people saved. And they're not. They're damning a lot of people to hell. But look at the statistics there. 54% and this was in 2010. We're in 2019 now. The whole world's going to be coming together in the time of Jacob's trouble under one religion. A world, one world religion. With Jesus, the name Jesus. Remember, people profess that they know God. Jesus is God. Okay. Jesus is, and the Trinity is going to be the foundation. But Jesus. There's not one person I've talked to that hasn't heard of the word in the name Jesus. Not one person. Okay. 1 John 4, 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What's the spirit of error? Antichrist. Okay? These people love the spirit of error because they're worshiping the Antichrist in spirit and they're falling for a false Jesus Christ. I keep pointing over here for the world. Okay? Um, I'm pleading with those who, you need to get it down. You need to get it figured out. Okay? Did you have godly sorrow? Okay? Am I saying I don't want the world? I don't, the world's way is sin. I don't want sin. My attitude towards sin changes. I go from justifying sin to having sorrow for sinning against God. Did I believe in the real Jesus Christ of Scripture? Did I believe in a Jesus Christ or did I believe in the Jesus Christ? Okay? 2 Thessalonians 2.11 Okay, we're going to leave with this. We're going to end with this. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. They believe that they're, they're worshipping Jesus Christ. They're worshipping Satan. That they should believe a lie. They're worshipping an antichrist. A Jesus Christ that's false. That they all might be damned going to hell, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They wanted the world. And you know what? God will let them believe. Okay? That's what it says here. And God will let them believe in a false Christ. He'll let them. They don't want anything to do with the Jesus Christ. He's going to let them. You...
false converts out there that believe in the A Jesus Christ, whether you be Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, Catholic, um, what was the statistics up here? Even if you're part of Islam, you believe in a Jesus Christ, you're going to go to hell if you don't believe in the Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. Right? God will let you because He has given you a perfect written word. He's given us a perfect written word. He has His people, truly saved, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women such as myself, and those out there with meekness and love are trying to say, let me tell you about the Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about true biblical repentance. Let me tell you about the plan of salvation. And they don't want to hear it. So God says, fine. You want to worship a false Jesus Christ and be damned to hell? Fine. You cannot skip repentance. Because your belief will not be in the Jesus Christ. You need to make sure that your belief is in the Jesus Christ, and your Jesus Christ lines up with Scripture. Right. This is very important. Godly sorrow leads to being broken, which leads to believing in the real Jesus Christ. Okay. Worldly sorrow leads to self-righteousness, which leads to believing in a false Christ. Um, remember we said, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. The world as a whole is worshiping Satan. Okay, they believe in a Jesus Christ. If you're part of that 50, was it 54%, and this is back in 2010, if you're part of that 54%, uh, you need to get out of that. You're going to be damned to hell if you stay in that. If you're in any of these religions that take repentance out, that take prayer out, that try to get you to believe in a false Jesus, you don't like the Jesus of the King James Bible? Even though you call yourself a Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman, you don't like this Jesus? Well, even these Baptist buildings now, well, I'll give you a Jesus that you can basically conform that Jesus to you. Jesus is supposed to conform to you, and I'll give you a Jesus that conforms to you. You can have the world. You can have, I'm whispering, you can have the world. Okay. But I'm whispering like it's secretly, you know, come on, you can come this way. Come to the world. Come to this 55%. Okay. If anything, with this Bible study, I know it was kind of long, but I just really wanted to, if God was showing me this from my heart, if you're believing in a false Jesus that doesn't line up with Scripture, it's because you refuse to truly repent. Truly, truly repent. Okay? It's because you're still trying to hold on to the world, and you refuse to let go of the world. Jesus went through so much because of the sins of the world. Why would you stick with the world? Okay, repent, believe in the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. Thank you for watching.